Well, tonight we're entering a section of the Bible that's one of my favorites. And uh, we're in Genesis in the 17th session out of 24, reviewing the book of Genesis, obviously. And uh, tonight we're going to take chapters 21, 22, and 24. I have some reasons for wanting to skip 23. We'll just tag that into next time session because there's a continuity of these three chapters. I'd like to be fresh in your mind as we jump in, and I don't want to jeopardize. I want 24 to be adjacent to 22. I don't want to end up having to break the session between now and next week. So that's why we have this peculiar arrangement. But uh, obviously, we were in the, up until last week, it, all about Abraham. We are now moving into a pair of sessions, this one and the next one, on Isaac. We will subsequently go to a couple on Jacob, and then we'll have about three, uh, three of them on, uh, uh, on uh, Joseph and the, in the close of the, the book. So, so uh, that speaks for itself. And obviously we're in that se segment of history that's after the flood but before the monarchy. Uh, it's an area that you might label in your notes the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And uh, as I say, we'll take chapter 21, we'll deal with the birth of Isaac, 22 is this strange chapter. Many people regard it as the strangest chapter in the Bible. The offering of Isaac. God endorses a child sacrifice? Well, it's, and it's, by the way, it's amazing to me how many commentaries fail to fully understand what that's really all about. And it'll be, I think, surprises in any case. And then, of course, 24 is the, the, the gathering of a bride for Isaac. So Isaac's the subject tonight. And uh, let's just jump in. Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said. Notice the name change. It's Sarah. It's got that hey in there. The breath. The letter H was added to her name and Abraham's, which is, is indicative of the Spirit of God. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived, and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. You know, that's, what was she, 90 and he was 100? That's, that's impressive, huh? That's... <laughs> and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah born to him, uh, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. What does the name Isaac mean? Do you remember? <laughs> Laughter. Itzak. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, mean, <laughs> it means laughter, which is great. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. <laughs> Indeed. Um, <laughs> You girls can probably appreciate that more than anybody. Can you imagine having a kid at 90? Yeah, that's a... <laughs> no way, right. <laughs> and she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Now, in that culture, by the way, it's far more emphatically an issue because the, the worst curse that a woman could think of is be, being barren. Their whole focus was to bear children. It is anyway, in many ways, but in, in that culture especially, that was, they felt their primary role was to give their husband an heir. And uh, so it was, uh, and the child grew as was, and, and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. I can imagine he would. Can you, you can imagine that celebration. But then the clouds start, in a sense. Sarah saw, that the, Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Ishmael now is about in his teens, probably 16 or 17. And so he is, um, you know, mocking this addition. He obviously sees this child as a rival, not only as a, 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 a charming little infant, but also that he was uh, born of the natural wife not of Hagar. So he's mocking. So wherefore she, that is Sarah, said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Very, very key verse, by the way. And uh, um, 
By the way, the word mocking that uh, Ishmael is a is a root word very close to laughter. It's very much a uh, vicious jesting, and uh, so. So Sarah's going to see that Hagar and her 16-year-old or 17-year-old son have to depart. And uh, the, uh, 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 well, this turns out to be a very, very key event for a lot of reasons because Paul, in his letter to Galatians, focuses on this in an allegorical format, if you will. Paul is going to use the rivalry between these two children, Ishmael and Isaac, to make a spiritual lesson. And so uh, it's appropriate for us to pa pause for a moment and, in fact, move to the New Testament in Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 22. Paul says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, in other words, Hagar, and the other by a free woman. But he, was, he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? Now don't misunderstand Paul's remark here. He's not suggesting that the story in Genesis is allegorical. It literally happened. These were real people. Some people uh, who don't take the Bible as seriously as we do often treat the Bible as an allegory. And there's dangers in that if you deny the reality of the narrative itself. However, there are again and again and again examples where the actual narrative is also God's way of communicating to us a profound truth. We're going to encounter one of the uh, peak allegories or types or uh, expressions of this kind in the scripture in the next chapter. But in any case, Paul's continuing here. He says, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. And the other one, of course, Sarah. Notice what Paul is doing. He's just con constructing a parallel, parallel. Nothing to do with the law. Ishmael has nothing to do with the law. He's just drawing a contrast between these two to make a point in the contrast between the law and, uh, you know, and the bondage. Otherwise. Okay. And this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. This is rather remarkable. Paul is speaking of two Jerusalems. He's speaking of the literal Jerusalem on the ground, which is bound by the law and Mosaic Judaism and so forth. And of course, by the way, in, 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 before that century is out and the, and the temple is destroyed, Judaism redefines itself into what we know as Talmudic Judaism, which is even worse in some respects. But Paul's making a contrast here between Hagar and Sarah, between the law and Jerusalem that's in bondage versus the free woman and grace and so forth. And he even makes it interesting, but the Jerusalem which is above. This is, I suspect, I forgot to check this, but I think it's right. This is probably the first place you see an allusion to what we think of as the heavenly Jerusalem of Genesis 22. He doesn't, put it, he doesn't go quite that far, but that's the same idiom he's using here in a sense. But he continues there in verse 27. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Wow. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh, namely Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. He's quoting Sarah here, see? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So this is Paul's sermon, if you will, using the text that we just read to make a much broader point. Now, on the one hand, he's showing the contrast between law and grace, in a sense, between the bondwoman being, being bondage to the law and the free woman that would, would represent having liberty in Christ. Uh, but that all derives from Isaac, not Ishmael. It's interesting to realize the spiritual warfare we watch daily in the paper. 
The whole attack of Islam, who would call itself the sons of Ishmael, is to attack the inheritance of Isaac. That's what's going on. A few complications. There's no Arab that can trace his lineage back to Ishmael. That's a myth, by the way, simply because they didn't keep um, separate. They co-mixed, co-mingled the tribes. But that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. The point is, it's interesting to notice who's persecuting who. When you go through an airport, they're not searching for an Israeli bomb. Think about it. He that was born after the flesh, namely Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit. And then he says, well, get this. Even so, it is now. You talk about contemporary application. Here it is. Every time you pick up a newspaper. It's not just Islam, by the way. It's the UN, the European community. And before, it's all over the US, probably. We'll turn against Israel. And God's commitment to them of that piece of land. That's the issue, the Abrahamic covenant. Here we are plunging our way into the, the first book of the Bible, one of the earliest books, excepting Job, of course. And, and yet, how timely it is for us today. I maintain that you cannot really understand what's going on in the headlines today unless you really understand the book of Genesis. So we happen to be in very topical areas here. But let's move on. Let's get back to Genesis 21, verse 11. So Sarah's obviously upset because in the household now with Ishmael in his teens and implicitly a rival of some kind, there's, there's tension. So he, she wants Hagar out. So we get to verse 11. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said to Abraham, this is important. He's, God's going to referee this for us. God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad. And because of the bondwoman, in all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Very, very important instruction for Abraham. God himself is regarding Isaac as his seed. Not Ishmael is regarded as seed only after the flesh, not after the spirit. Isaac was born supernaturally. He was born supernaturally. He was named. In fact, there's a whole list of things. You can take as your own personal little assignment, if you like, is to list all the ways that Isaac and Christ were similar. Both were forecast, both supernaturally born, both named before they were born, and you can go right through the list. It's quite interesting. I was going to do that too, but I got more ground to cover. I figure that's a nice little assignment for you people to do on your own notepad. Let's move on. And also the son of the bondwoman, Will I make a nation because he is thy seed? In other words, God is going to honor his commitment to Abraham to be the, the, the father of many nations. And there's going to be many nations come out of Ishmael. In fact, Ishmael is going to have 12 sons, just like Jacob will ultimately have. So Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. In other words, she's out in the desert, she's destitute, she's ready to wash her hands, he, he thinks it's over. She went and sat, uh, and sat her down over and against him a good way off, as it were, a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over and against him, lift up her voice, and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. She had actually given up, but God intervenes. Arise and lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, and I, for I will make him a great nation. You know, from this language, especially in the English translation, you get the impression this kid's an infant. That's why he's always shown that way in your Sunday school books. But if you do the, do the math, you'll discover he was about 16 when Isaac was born. So this is a teenager. In fact, in that culture, he was a fairly mature kid. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness, and he became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. 
And his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And uh, so, see, on the father's death, the mother now looks out. See, for, from her point of view, the father's as good as dead. They're separated. So she's got to look out for him and find a wife for him and so forth uh, because he's uh, uh, deprived of the usual kind of, of sponsorship, if you will. So she looked cast about and to get a marriage connection for him, which w it was the normal parental thing to do. We, we're not used to that, but that culture, the parents arrange the marriages. And uh, so, uh, and he will ultimately, of course, marry an Egyptian. It came to pass at that time that Abimelech, and you keep running into Abimelechs, recognize that's a title. That's a title. Um, the Melech is king. So, but uh, anyway, uh, that Abimelech, and Phicol, the chief captain of the host, spake unto Abram, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son. But according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And uh, so there's going to be a major, major commitment here, a promise, a covenant, if you will, that gives, gives the name to this famous well, at Beersheba. And uh, so it's a very solemn thing, and the, the, the proposal was reasonable and agreed to. And uh, the, uh, the, this, will, this is part of the explanation of why the name Beersheba. I'll come to that in a minute. And uh, so it'll always, throughout uh, uh, history, bear evidence of this covenant with these people, which a covenant which allowed them all to dwell safely. And uh, Abram said, I will swear. And Abram reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I, I, I wot not who hath done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard of, I, heard of it until today. So this, see the whole idea of taking over a well or having to sink another one and so forth, in that area, water was so precious. And so there were rules, there were etiquettes, there were things. And so the, uh, the, uh, uh, if they were allowed to get out of repair, the guy that restored it was inclined, it was allowed to have title to it. So there's a whole uh, possessions, nine tenths of the law kind of thing here. And so in unoccupied lands like this, the possession of wells gave, were in effect, a claim on the land itself. See? So uh, the dread of this, of course, is what led to the tensions here, and they resolve it here with this, uh, this um, uh, covenant. It's interesting that commentators argue whether they think there, there are several wells in that area. The well of Beersheba is not one. There's four or five of them. I'm going to suggest to you that they've got a couple they haven't discovered yet because the word Sheva is, means both covenant, Beersheba, the well of the covenant, also means the well of the seven. So I suspect there weren't four or five. There are probably seven. But it's my, it's my guess. I can't, I can't prove it archaeologically. Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them into Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham sent seven interesting, ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abram, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou dost set by themselves? And he said, These are seven ewe lambs shalt thou take out of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. And I mean, when he says this well, I mean collectively the seven, I think. There's several there in that area. An oasis kind of thing. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there they swear both of them. The trick here is that the name Sheva and Shiva are there are two words that the vowel tone determines whether you mean covenant or seven. See, it's a, a, a play on words in a sense. Beersheba, by the way, is where the David Ben Gurion of the University of the Negev is, and uh, that's where they have a huge installation. That's where the Israelis are developing all kinds of ways to reclaim desert. That's where they're also developing not only to, ways to purify water, because that's crucial, but also they're trying to develop plants that will operate on seawater where you can irrigate with seawater. So there, there, there are lots of in, in, very ingenious things going down. Uh, I, had, I was a guest of the president down there uh, some years ago, and it was a fascinating visit. But uh, you're down, you're in Negev, you're down in the real desert. This is the southern, in a sense, the southernmost uh, uh, of the habitable, habitable portion of that region. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba, and then Abimelech rose up, and Phi called the chief of the captain's host, and they returned unto the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and called there the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. Okay, now that's chapter 21. Okay. Now we get into one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and you'll see why. The offering of Isaac. This is where God would seem, in the minds of some, to endorse child sacrifice. 
How many believe that God endorses child sacrifice? Anyone? Okay, we don't have to go down that path. Great. I want to mention something else before we get into this chapter so you'll fully appreciate the chapter, not just for its content, but for the methodology it can teach you, the hermeneutics, if you will. In Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, there is a verse that I'd like to amplify a little bit. We know, by the way, from Romans 15, 4, the Bible tells us that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Whatsoever things. In other words, everything in the Bible, and I take that very strictly, I think every word, every number, every detail, is there for our learning. And one of the great treasure hunts you encounter in your life is when you find something a little strange, is to dig into it, get in behind it, and you'll be treated to a discovery. God always rewards the diligent. But one of the ways God communicates is also underscored here in Hosea 12, verse 10, where God says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Well, visions, I think we understand. Spoken by prophets, we understand. What on earth is a similitude? What does that mean? Well, we just saw one that Paul used about the bondwoman casting out her son. That's, in a sense, in a broad sense, a similitude. There are figures of speech in the Bible. That's one reason, you know, I was on a radio program being uh, uh, interviewed, and, and uh, someone called in. And they were it was obviously somebody that was sort of a, a you know one of these liberal guys, people who takes a liberal view. And I was about to say that I t we take the Bible literally, but I stumbled on that word because I knew the minute I said that they would say that the rebuttal is well then you think God has feathers because in Psalm 91 under His wings thou shalt trust. You know, it's a figure. And for some reason the Holy Spirit he says I didn't say we take the Bible literally. I says we take it seriously. And when I heard how upset the caller got, I knew I struck gold. Because he wouldn't, he's not willing to admit that he doesn't take it as seriously as we do, but that's obviously the point, see? And uh, so I don't, see, when you say take it literally, when you say that in a strict sense, that means you deny figures of speech, and we don't. They're obviously figures of speech in the Bible. By the way, let me ask you, well, I, I've listed here one, two, three, four, five, about six of them, six figures of speech, right? A simile, an allegory, a metaphor, a pecanastasis, which most people even don't know about, a type, analogy. How many different kinds of figures of speech do you think are in the Bible? Anyone? 200. Oh, you cheated. <laughs> Gary, you cheated. 200, yes. We've cataloged over 200 of them. They appear in appendix to our book, Cosmic Codes. But the point is, and each one of these is not only defined more precisely than you see here, but also has biblical examples of their use. A simile is a form of resemblance. You find it in Genesis 25, Matthew 7, and elsewhere. An allegory, that's a comparison by representation. Genesis 49 is an example. We just saw one in Galatians 4. That was an allegory. Paul even calls it that. There's a metaphor, which is another form of representation. And these things have slightly different definitions. I'm going to spare you the precision here. That's in Matthew 26. A hypocatastasis is, a strain, is, is an implied resemblance or representation by its opposite. And that's an unusual structure, but anyway, in rhetoric. There's a type. That's a, the word type, used this way, is a very common term in biblical commentary. The word type is the classic um, academic term. You and I would tend to use the term a model. It's a model of such and such. Uh, we, we, we think of, of uh, when you're going to build a house, you often will build a model of the house to get a feeling for how the spaces relate. An architect will often do that. So that's, a, that's a, like a prototype, see? But that's, a, again, a type, if you will. And uh, so a type is a figure of an example of something in the future. And that's one of the th We're going to see in this chapter what is often regarded as the classic type in the Bible. That's why I wanted to lay this groundwork. There's also an analogy. That's a resemblance in some particular things between two things that are otherwise different. We take two things that are fundamentally different, but they have a certain similarity trying to highlight. We call that an analogy. So each one of these figures of speech have slightly subtle differences, but they're all figures of speech. Well, let's jump in to Genesis 22 and see what it says. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham! He said, Behold, here I am. He said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, 
whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Oh, wait a minute, guys. He's waited a lot of years to have a child. He finally, at 100 years old, gets God's special gift, Isaac. And God wants him now to offer him up. You think that would shake him up? You betcha. You betcha. But you'll discover when you get here to Genesis 22, by now, Abraham's really learned his lessons. He's made some mistakes along the way. We didn't dwell on those, but you saw them as we went along. By the time he had Genesis 22, he'd learned his lesson. Because in the next verse, he's going to get up early in the morning and take off with Isaac to fulfill this. You say, wow, that's impressive. Well, you also, I suspect, from the verses I'll show you shortly, you need to know and understand something else. How could Abraham do that? Because he trusted God. In fact, he knew that God had promised that Isaac would have children. Isaac hasn't had any children yet. So from Abram's point of view, God's got a problem. I don't have a problem. God's got a problem. If I offer him, God is going to have to resurrect him. Back in chapter 15, verse 6, it said, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It's a very famous, it's quoted several times in the New Testament. He didn't just believe God. That's what the verse says. He believed in God. It's actually what it says. He trusted God and believed in the resurrection of Isaac. One of the astonishing things you'll discover when you get to the book of Hebrews, it was Abraham's conviction that Isaac would be resurrected that saved him. And that's also true of you and me. We can believe about Christ. We can believe that he's a great teacher. We can even believe that he did some miracles. That's not the gospel. Paul defines the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. How that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That third day thing we'll come back to. Let's, get, let's take a look here now. Okay, God says, now there's another thing about this that if you studied your Bible carefully, you've learned about the law of first mention. The first place a thing appears in the scripture usually turns out to be very definitive, very important. If you look at verse 2 here, God says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. Oh, by the way, strange phrase here. Let me pick this up first. Thine only son? What's that all about? I thought he had Ishmael. See, not from God's point of view. From God's point of view, this is his only son and the promise. But then you see this expression, whom thou lovest. See that? That word is the first place in the Bible that the word love appears. And I think that's design. That should echo, you might put in the in your margin of your Bible, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only son. That whosoever believes him shall not perish. That's a clue, by the way, of what's going to happen here. This is going to echo that in advance. And I'll tell you something else that uh, I'll let, let the cat out of the bag. Abraham knew. He was acting out prophecy. Let's go on and see what he says. God says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And I love this verse. Abraham rose up early in the morning. Okay, let's get at it. You know, realize that God almost every day will ask you a question. How much do you trust me? God finds almost every day a new way to ask us that question in our lives. Well, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. So there's four guys going on this trip, Abram and Isaac and two young men. And Isaac his son, and they clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Now if you look at a map, they're down here in Beersheba, it's the southern part, just south, further south than the Dead Sea is. And they go up from Beersheba, a three-day journey, it's about 50 miles, but it's pretty rough country. 
takes him three days to get to a place. It wasn't called Jerusalem in those days. It was called Salem. It becomes Jerusalem later, but I put it on the map in a way that you'd recognize it. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Remember that distance. It's a three-day journey. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So they get to this hill. It's actually a ridge system. He leaves the donkey and the two young men at the bottom of the hill. And he and Isaac are going to go up the hill. Isaac's got the wood on his back. They're heading up the hill. He says to the young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, by the way, the term for lad here is a tip-off. You and I are victims of our Sunday school coloring books. We always see a small child. I personally believe that Isaac, well, we know that he was under 37, because he will be that shortly in a subsequent chapter. I personally believe he was 30-some years of age. That, chat, that gives you a little different view here. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and, and come again unto you. Now, either Abraham is bluffing or stalling or expects Isaac to be resurrected while they're up on the hill. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son. Notice who's carrying the wood up the hill. And by the way, this isn't a 12-year-old that's carrying this wood. It's a young man, okay? And he took the fire in his hand and the knife and they both, they went both of them together. The word in the, the translation isn't quite faithful. The, he, the Hebrew says they both went in agreement is what the term actually says. Slightly different but important. We'll come again unto you. So Abraham apparently is either stalling them or has an expectation that when he's done what God's asked him, God's going to resurrect Isaac. It's Abraham's belief in the resurrection of Isaac that's crucial here. Well, <laughs> I love this. They're going up the hill. And Isaac spoke unto Abram his father and said, My father? He says, Here I am, my son. Um, behold the fire and the wood, but uh, where, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> Something's missing, Dad, you know. The dad didn't say, Well, son, you're it, you know. He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> Abram said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went, both of them, in agreement, or together. You know, when I used to read uh, verse 8, I often used to think, well, gee, you know, Abram just stalling the kid until he got to the top of the hill, right? Until I read that sentence very carefully. God will provide who? Himself. And we're going to discover that on that very spot, 2,000 years later, the fa another father will offer his son as an offering for sin. So we move on here a little bit. He's going to offer himself a, a lamb for a burnt offering. I love that. And they came to the place where God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, as you would with an offering, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Boy, can you imagine the drama here? And Isaac is yielding to this. He's doing this in agreement we miss that part. See, we always visualize a small child, maybe overpowered by his father and tied, that he's, he's, he's yielded to this errand he's got to run. And uh, no, Isaac is part of the action here. Lay him on the wood. And Abram stretched forth his hand and took a knife to slay his son. He's going through with this. He doesn't know he's going to be in, is there going to be an intervention here. But he recognized that's God's problem, not his problem. Why? Because God has promised that he'd have children. So he knows God's going to do something here. Somehow this is going to come out okay. You know, I often see a, I've seen, not, not often, I've seen a, a, several movies where the, it's a fanciful plot line where some person, the key person in the movie is really the subject of a prophecy and that he's going to win and he battles evil and then finally wins, you know. And sometimes during the plot line, halfway through the battle, he realizes he's prophesied to win, so he gets courageous because he knows how it's going to end, right? And it's just part of the story. But I'm always amused by that because we're in the same shoes. We're engaged in spiritual warfare, very serious one. If you don't believe it, just watch the democratic rhetoric. Um, and I'm not, I'm not making a political statement. I mean, they're, they're committed against, against everything of our heritage. And again, I'm not, I don't think the Republicans are much better, just not as well organized. The point is, um, 
we're in a spiritual warfare, but you know, as we get, it's easy to get depressed until you go back and read the scripture because we can read the last chapter. We win, guys, you know. And I think Abraham had much of that man, same mentality. He knew that Isaac would have to be resurrected. And if you look at the topography, this I think will be very illuminating. This is a topo map, a topological map of that region. And Mount Moriah is actually a ridge system. It starts about six at the south end, about 600 feet, uh, meters above sea level. It rises, and there's sort of a saddleback at about 741 meters above sea level, but it continues to rise to a peak. And uh, on the west of it, there's a hill called Mount Zion, and there's a, there was at one time a valley between Mount Zion and uh, the, the Mount Moriah Ridge called the Taropian Valley. It, through the centuries, it's gotten pretty much filled in. But uh, to the uh, east of Mount Moriah, there's the Kidron Valley, which is still quite prominently there, uh, between it and the Mount of Olives. So you've really got, if you visualize three hills, going from east to west, it would be Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, and then the Mount Moriah Ridge, and then a valley, and then Mount Zion. And Jerusalem, of course, has migrated from the ridge uh, westward, so that valley's really been filled in, and most of modern Jerusalem is in the area that was originally Mount Zion, and so it, it, Mount Zion becomes a synonym for the whole city, of course. And to the south, you have a valley called the Hinnom Valley, and that's was the city dump and so forth, and that gives rise to the, the idiom of Gehenna as a place that was always smoldering from the, the rubbish and so forth. Anyway, so this ridge system then, uh, what Abraham is doing with Isaac is they're going up this ridge system. What's not shown on the map, the southern end of this is a place called Salem. We ran into that in Genesis 14. The king of Salem was a guy by the name of Melchizedek. It's my suggestion that Abram did not offer Isaac in town. He went up the hill above the town, which would be up over the saddleback to the peak. And as you go up the saddleback to see that Salem, or Ophel as it's now called, is the southern part of this, there's a saddleback on the way that later becomes the thrashing floor of Aruna that David purchases from Aruna and becomes the site of the temple. It's a Jewish tradition that is where, at the temple where, at that site is where Abram offered Isaac. And that's what they believe and that's fine, but I don't happen to think so. I believe Abraham went right up to the top. Because up at the peak there, which happens to be, don't make anything of this, but it happens to be 777 meters above sea level. It's another uh, 36 meters higher than the temple area in altitude. And uh, amplifying this map a little bit, that's a place that's called Golgotha. And I think I personally hold the view that Abraham offered Isaac at the peak, out of town, up on the top of the mountain, in effect, at the top of the hill at that time. And uh, uh, another father, 2,000 years later on that very spot, was going to offer his son as an offering that would be the pivot point of the entire universe, the entire creation. Not only you and me, but the entire creation is redeemed. We forget that. I saw a new heaven as a new earth. There's a lot more going on than just you and I, although we're the focus of it. Now, just as Abraham is ready to plunge the knife, the an angel of the Lord called unto him out of the heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here am I. I haven't gone anywhere, guys. Here I am. You girls recognize that. You always have to tell men twice. Did you notice that? <laughs> Abraham, Abraham, Eli, Eli. You know, you find that, you, always have, you, you girls have found that out. You always have to tell men twice. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Do you think God learned something here? I don't think so. You make it sound like, see, now, now I know you trust me. That's not the point. Now we know that Abraham trusted him. It's a demonstration. God's not surprised. He counted on it for crying out loud. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, speaking of God, he's he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? One of the pivotal points in that incredible chapter of Romans 8. I couldn't resist sort of inserting it here. But something else I want to show you. You may recall when we went through the book of Leviticus in chapter 1, verse 11. They had to say, where did they offer the sin offering? He shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord. 
and the priests and Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood round about the altar. Okay? Northward, on the north side of the camp, outside the camp. It's interesting, they take the offering then and they shall carry it forth without the camp, on the outside of the camp, unto a clean place. A couple of interesting points. Golgotha is just outside the precincts of Jerusalem, on the north side. Do you see the patterning here? See the patterning? But there's some, another subtlety, as long as I'm on this, I'd like to add to this. They had to bury the remains in a clean place, a place that's Leviticus clean. This is Leviticus 4, 6, 10, and Numbers 19, number place that get into that. When we read about the crucifixion of Christ in Isaiah 53, there's a very famous verse, you may remember in verse 9, it says, He made his grave with the wicked and was with the rich in his death. Remember that? We often talked about that. I always used to feel he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in death. Well, he's in the rich in his death because it was Joseph Arimathea's thing. I always felt the wicked meant the two thieves. See, he died among two thieves. That's, that was always the way I visualized this verse. But I'm indebted to Andrew Bonar and his commentary in Leviticus when we went through that. He highlighted the fact that this refers to the burial. The word wicked there is in the plural, and the word rich is in the singular. He's talking about the fact that Jesus is, well, prophetically speaking, will be buried in a rich man's tomb, singular, but it will be among the wicked. And yet, it has to be Levitically clean, right? And so he, he points out the only way that can be, it has to be carved out of a rock. It may physically be among a burial of others, but it has to be Levitically clean out of a rock and unused. Well, when you get to Luke, we learn a little bit about Joseph of Arimathea. It says, Behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor. He was a good man and just. The same had not consented to the counsel and the deed of them. In other words, he's on the Sanhedrin, but he didn't agree with them. Key point I'll come back to. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews. He who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. See, the man of faith. You with me so far? Okay. Joseph Arimathea. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a disciple of Christ. He was driven into concealment due to the plots on his life for having defended Jesus before the Sanhedrin openly. Most people don't realize this. Joseph Arimathea was underground because he spoke up for Christ at the Sanhedrin and because that his life was at risk. I'll show you why, how we know that. It's by one letter in the Greek. His appearance, when he shows up before Pilate, Pilate was shocked. Why? First of all, he had access to Pilate. That tells you he was a heavy. But Pilate was surprised to see him for several reasons because he had been underground like a fugitive. And so uh, it would have been a shock to the Jewish leadership too. When you get to John 19, it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, is what your Bible says. That's not quite accurate. I'll come back to that. Secretly, but for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he went to Pilate. And you all know that story. I've told you that a dozen times, I'm sure. He went to Pilate, and Pilate's shocked. You're going to get, you have this brand new tomb for your family, and you're going to give it to this criminal? And Joseph says, Oy vey, it's just for the weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I have to work that in. So he came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Now the point is, see this word secretly? That's the way it's been translated in your Bibles. And that's in the, um, in, in, in the Greek, it's not spelled this way. It's spelled with one letter. The next to the last letter is a different letter, which means it's an adjective, not an adverb. He didn't believe, he didn't, he wasn't secretly, he was secreted because of the Jews. The difference between an adverb here and an adjective is, is profound. It tells you that he wasn't just privately a secret disciple. Some of you may be secretly a Christian. You know, people at work don't really know you're sold out to Christ. I hope that's not true, but you know what you're saying? Being secreted is quite another. That means you're undercover. You follow me? 
So you get a little different perspective of our, of our friend uh, Nic uh, uh, Joseph. And it says, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, that was back in John 3, brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pound weight, and they took the body of Jesus, wound it in their linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, notice where the, the grave is where they were crucified. Where was he crucified? On Golgotha. Right next to that, is where if you've been to Israel and visited the Garden Tomb, you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it's just a short walk to where the Garden Tomb is. And as you go by there, you go by a cistern, a 250,000 gallon cistern. It's a huge cave in it for storing water. The size of that cistern tells you that that area was under a single owner, a very rich person, you see. There's a place crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never a man laid. Now, and this is Golgotha, so Joseph's new tomb was hewn out of rock adjacent to the spot where the criminals were put to death. You with me? The, clean, the stony sides of the tomb, a new tomb, a clean place, Levitically, that's where Jesus lay, was part of the malefactor. See, that whole hill is a cemetery. It's on the side of what actually is a mountain, of, you know, is a hill where there's a lot of people buried. Thus his dead body is with the rich man and among the wicked in the hour of his death. It fulfills Isaiah 53, right? His grave was a property rich man, and yet the rocks which form the partition between his tomb and that of the other malefactors are themselves part of Golgotha and make it Levitically, it makes it Levitically keen. And there, if you've been there, you know, you've been, you know what it looks like. There's actually, it's, it, there are about 18 different specifics that are true here, and they're also in the text. There's a little chamber, you go in, what's called a weeping chamber, and just to the right there's a place where there's two places. And... Uh, um, there's also evidence when this was discovered that it was, it was a chapel for a while in the early centuries. People worshipped there but and afterwards. But the garden tomb, I want to mention a few things about the garden. See, you and I have the benefit of having been there. And, and the cynics, the Catholics and others who don't buy this particular location call it Gordon's Calvary. Because General Charles Gordon discovered it. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in 1852. He served the Crimean War a few years later. He distinguished himself in the Taiping Rebellion against the Manchu Dynasty in 1860, about the time of our Civil War. He had diplomatic and military engineering missions in England and Europe through the 1860s through 70s. He was the governor of Sudan in 1877. He served with the British government in India, China, Maritis, Maritis and, and uh, South Africa. And uh, he discovered the garden tomb in Jerusalem in 1883. He was in his hotel, and he looked out and saw a skull-shaped rock, sort of. And he was curious about that because from his knowledge of the Bible, so he had it excavated, and they discovered a tomb there. But understand, most of it was covered when he, he, he just saw the top part of it. But he was famous for discovering that. I'll tell you what blew me away as I realized this, and I went back and checked my dates. What really flabbergasted me is I had learned most of what I've just shown you before this from Andrew Bonar's commentary on Leviticus, which was published in 1846, 37 years before the garden tomb was found. I was reading Bonar's commentary, boy, and it all made sense. I thought, wow, isn't this neat stuff? Because I could visualize it having been there. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I said, wait a minute, this is 1846, wasn't it? And I checked. No, it was 37 years later that General Gordon, not for this thing, just from the topography, discovers the garden tomb. I think that's fascinating, that Andrew Bonar put, the, put this all together from his knowledge of the text, not from having seen it. I think that's interesting. Well, anyway, let's move on. So Abraham has been uh, held back from offering Isaac, and Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, behind him a ram was caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So here we have the substitutionary ram introduced. And this is mentioned in Leviticus 9, Exodus 29, Numbers 5, and so forth. The substitutionary ram. But here's a very revealing verse. Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Yireh, or Jehovah Jireh, as some people would say it. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Wait a minute, gang. Let's examine that carefully. Abraham is naming the place prophetically. I submit to you that he knew somehow that he was participating 
in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an action that was prophetic. I'm not saying he knew that 2,000 years later Jesus Christ would be crucified on the spot, but he might have. He certainly understood that he was somehow in God's prophetic program. When you get to Hebrews chapter 11, you learn something else. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And by the way, the word seed in many key passages is singular, not plural. You don't tell that in the English. It's not Isaac shall thy seed, meaning lots of people born. No, no. It's seed singular, and you might even capitalize it. Who's the seed? The seed of the woman. The Messiah. And Paul in Galatians will make that point. Galatians 3, he makes that whole point. That the seed is singular, not plural, in certain key passages. Anyway, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Whence, from, from whence also he received him in a figure. Notice that verse 19. Abraham was accounting that God was able to raise him up. See, Abraham was counting on the fact that God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. That's why he could go through with this. He trusted God. Even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. In other words, he received Jesus Christ by his adoption of this figure, this rhetorical device, this, this, this uh, uh, typology, if I can use that term. Now we get to the book of Revelation. One of its pivotal passages, Revelation chapter 5, where John says, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Written in and on the backside. It's a title deed. Sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. The word goes out, right? And we have this terrifying sentence. And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth. That's an interesting phrase. There's three, three places to be, either in the heaven, or in the earth, or under the earth. I think, see, I, I have a geocentric concept of, of Hades, but let's not get into that here. No man in heaven or in, or, in, or in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. You and I don't really appreciate what that means, but John did. He says, I sobbed convulsively. Or in the English here, I, I wept much because no man was found worthy. A man. See, it had to be a kinsman of Adam to open this title deed, to take, to take, redeem what Adam had forfeited. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open, and, to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So John is shook up because of the generality of the previous verse. But an elder nearby says, wait. One of the elders said to me, hey, weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And John says, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, or four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the lamb, not a lamb, stood the lamb as it had been slain. Stood the lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth in all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and that starts the whole sequence of taking possession of that which he purchased on that cross. The lamb as it had been slain. All of this echoed in advance by this action of Abraham on Go at Golgotha going through the uh, uh, act of offering his son. Well, let's get back to Genesis 22. We've got a lot to cover here yet. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, uh, thy, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And, in thy, and by the way, there's a place you see the seed singular. His, not their enemies, his enemies. See, it's a person. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast made my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. I'm going to come back to this verse, but I want to show you something else first. Let's move on. It came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath borne children of thy brother Nahor, Huz's firstborn, Buzz's brother, there's Huz and Buzz again, and uh, Kemuel, and father of Aram, and Chesed, and Hazo, and Bildash, and 
Jidlaf, and Bethuel. These are the sons of, we saw that, on, we'll see that shortly. I'll refresh your memory on the family tree here in the next chapter. And Bethuel begot Rebekah, Rebecca, that's who we're going to talk about. And these eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Aram's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Ruma. She also bare Teba, Gehem, Thahash, and Maka. That ends chapter 22. I'm going to skip 23, which has, deals with the death of Sarah. We'll, we'll tag that in next time. I want to, while this is all fresh in your mind, to get into chapter 24 for another surprise. Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Now, obviously, as he gets old, one of the things he's concerned about is Isaac having seed. Isaac's got to get married to have seed. So Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house, this is an interesting guy, his eldest servant. This is the guy that would have inherited everything that Abraham had if he didn't have issue. So we think of an eldest servant as a menial. I think it will be more valid to visualize him as his business partner. Okay? I want you to notice his name doesn't show here. I'll come back to that in a minute. Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, get that, ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. This was an ancient form of an intimate commitment. It may strike us as rather strange, and I'm not going to get more graphic with you, but you can fill in the blanks. I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son out of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred to take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now he, he's going to send this guy on an errand to go and gather a, a bride. They, they, they're going to arrange the marriage, but they don't want it from the local tribes for obvious reasons. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again into the land from whence thou camest? Interesting remark. Abram said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. He does not want Isaac out of the country. I wonder why. I don't know why. But I do know this. Jesus never left the country either. Isn't that interesting? There are all kinds of stories that it is the British Isles. I'm not getting into that thing here. Okay, Those are stories. Now, Teres, we went through Terah's family before. This is by refresh your memory. Abraham, Nahor, and Haran were the three brothers. Sarah was a sister, married Abraham. You know all that. Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and so forth. And under uh, Nahor, Nahor had one of his sons was Bethuel, who had a daughter, Rebekah, and a son, Laban. Both of them are going to be very, very prominent in the chapter forthcoming because Rebekah is going to end up being the bride for Isaac. See how this fits together? And uh, Laban will have two daughters also, that will become very important in the subsequent chapter when we deal with uh, Jacob looking for a bride. Let's get back here to Genesis 24, verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and, did, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. In other words, I want you to go there, get her. If you won't come, you're off the hook. But in any case, Isaac's not going to go there. That's what basically he's saying, right? The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear unto him concerning the matter. Then the servant took ten camels. Wow. And he took men with him too, by the way. He had an armed guard with him. Um, of camels of his master and departed, and all, and all the goods of his master were in his hand. See, he was the heir. He was the, he was the steward of all the resources of Abraham. Uh, and he rose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down without the city, outside the city, by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. That's what, that was one of the evening chores. And he said, now he prays, the servant now prays. He says, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of the water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for my servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. So he's setting up what some of us might call a fleece, sort of like Gideon did. I'm going to say this to the girl, and if she offers not only to give it to me, but also offers on her own initiative 
to take care of my camels, which is unusual. That's a, you know, that's a, that's an extra step. That would be his signal, so to speak. What came to pass before he'd done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. That's kind of important. You know, let's get this. Let's get she also, by the way, is a very spirited gal. We're going to discover it. She, she's, a, she's, a, she's very passive in this whole story. But we'll find out later. She's, 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 quite, she's quite a person. Anyway, the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin. Neither had, known any, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, What do you mean? You're a grown man. You can do it for yourself. No, no, that's what she said. <laughs> she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and set down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him to drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. You know, it's interesting how a small extension of hospitality can change careers. <laughs> and she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water and drew for all the camels, or ten of them. That's a lot of camels, by the way, can go a long time without water. You know how they do it? They drink a lot when they get a chance. You know? <laughs> Watering 10 camels is a non-trivial chore, by the way. I, had, I didn't do the homework to give you the numbers, but it, you can imagine, you can fill in the blanks. Anyway, the man wondering at her held his peace to it whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. It came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her, uh, for, for her hands, 10 shekels weight of gold. They constantly, they were very typically, were Bracelet, bracelets for the wrist all the way to the elbow. That was a thing in those days. And whether this is an earring or nose ring is a debate of some scholars debate in terms of style, but who knows. Anyway, and he said, whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom, which she bare unto Nahor. She said, moreover in him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. So they, the latchkey's out, guy. And the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. See, this is very fortuitous, because she is exactly of the lineage and the family that he's looking for. What a coincidence. <laughs> the rabbis say coincidence is not a kosher word, and that's what they mean here. The damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. And Laban ran out to meet unto the man and unto the well. And it came to pass when he saw the earring and the bracelets. Ha, ha, ha. Laban's got a sharp eye. <laughs> uh, we get an insight into Laban's character. This guy's got money. All right. Saw the earring and the bracelets of my sister's hands. And when he heard the herds of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man. And behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. The man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels, and he gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. See, there's, some, there's an entourage here, just in, uh, you know, this guy by himself. And there was set meat before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. He said, speak on. He said, I am Abraham's servant. And this is probably a guy he's certainly heard of because he's a, he's a prominent member, not only a member of the family, a very prominent one. And the Lord said, had blessed my, blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. So he's the heir of all that Abram has. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go to my father's house and to my kindred to take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Peradventure, the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord, before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. And then thou shalt be clear of this my oath when thou comest to my kindred. And if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. And I came to stand of the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh to draw forth water, I say unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher drink. She said unto me, drink, uh, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. Let, let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out of my master's son. 
And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water, and I said unto her, Give me a drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. He's recounting exactly what happened here. And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? He said, Daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milka, who Milka bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord, the blessed. Uh, and bless the Lord God of my master Abraham, which he led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right or the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard these words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and gave them to Rebekah, and gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. So he's giving gifts. That's going to be important later. I'll come back to that. They did eat and drink, he and the men that were with them. They tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten after that she shall go. He said to them, Hitter me not, seeing the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. They called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? She says, I will go. You know, that's a gutsy gal. Now, they're, they're used to arranged marriages on the one hand, but um, she's never met this guy. She doesn't know what she's getting into. You know, her husband could weigh 400 pounds and I could go on and on, you know. She didn't know. She says, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abram's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And Rebekah rose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and they followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came. Now, now, now we shift home side. Isaac came from the way of the well of Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. The word meditate there, by the way, um, implies he was lamenting and moaning. We've skipped a chapter where his mother died. So the, 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 the complexion here might be that he was specifically mourning the death of his mother. But in any case, he meditated in the field at the eventide and lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. And uh, what it means is she slipped off the camel and laid prostrate. This was the appropriate etiquette for the junior to do that to the senior. And uh, so it would, be, uh, uh, it would be unmannerly for her to remain seated if Isaac's coming walking. And so uh, uh, you, you always uh, alight in the presence of rank, uh, no exception being made for men, women in this situation. And many people misunderstand that. You have people say, well, she, you know, she fell off the camel. No, no. She, the word in the fall is to be cast down to fall prostrate before, is, is the term. Anyway, she said unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant said, this is my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself. See, it was, uh, that was an essential part of female dress. And uh, it was, especially in, the, in, the, in, the, in front of a stranger. She would, the first time he would see her face is after the marriage was consummated. That sounds very strange to us, but that'll be very important to understand when we get to Jacob's situation, which is, Laman really pulls a fast one on him. But anyway, uh, a betrothed woman would stay veiled until after the marriage had been consummated. And only on, the, on that night would the husband see her unveiled. Anyway, so she covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he, he had done. And Isaac brought her unto his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah. She became his wife. And he loved her. Indeed he did. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So what we've seen here is a bride for Isaac. But I want you to stop now and try to apply what we learned in chapter 22. 22 was a type, we call it. Abraham was a type of what? The father, right? Okay. Isaac was a type of? Christ, of the son. Right, right on. Okay. Well, we have the same situation here. We have Abram the father, 
and we, he commissions his eldest servant to get a bride for Isaac. What is the eldest servant a type of? The Holy Spirit. Now here's the payoff that fascinates me. You can't tell the name of the, 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 the servant from this chapter. But if you trot back to chapter 15, you'll discover what his name is. His name is Eliezer. Do you know what Eliezer means? Comforter. Comforter. Right on. That blow you away? I think. But it's more than that. It's more than that. Every time the Holy Spirit is in a type, and there's several times he does this, he's always an unnamed servant. Here in this chapter, they could have said Eliezer did this. No, no, he's an unnamed servant. When you get to the book of Ruth, Boaz, he's the kinsman redeemer ultimately. And here comes Ruth, the Gentile bride. Who introduces Ruth to Boaz? An unnamed servant in chapter 1. You always see the Holy Spirit. And, how, and, and why does he do that? Because in John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus tells you, I'm going to send you the comforter who will never testify of himself. And I think it's fascinating to see the precision with which those issues are dealt with throughout the scripture. I think this is fascinating because it's evidence of the integrity of the total package. And there's even a mind, more mind-blowing thing I'll come to in a minute. But Abraham commissions Eliezer to gather a bride. Eliezer qualifies her by a well. She agrees to marry the bridegroom. He gives her gifts. That's what the Holy Spirit does to each of us. Gives us our spiritual gifts, right? She joins the bridegroom at the well of Lahai Roy, which is the well of he that sees me. So Abraham's the father, Isaac the son, Eliezer the Holy Spirit, sent to gather a bride for the son. But I want to go back now and examine a very strange verse that you may not have noticed when we were back there in Genesis 22. They've just been up on the hill. God has intervened. They've substituted the ram. So the big event is now behind them. You get to verse 19. It says, So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abram dwelt in Beersheba. It's just a verse which says, hey, they all went home, right? But I want you to know something strange. But you know something, anything strange about that verse? Where's Isaac? Exactly. It lists the people that went home. These two guys with the donkey have been down at the bottom of the hill during the whole episode. It says, Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. Don't misunderstand me. I take for granted that Isaac tagged along. He obviously went home. But that's not what it says. Does Abraham and his young men rose up and went together to Beersheba? And the mystery I want you to think about is where is Isaac? And you're going to make a very bizarre discovery. You'll discover that the person of Isaac has been edited out of the record from the time that he's offered on that hill until he's united with his bride. You, you hear me? I think that's fascinating. Jesus Christ, from the crucifixion to the rapture, is separate. He's, he's, he's not visible. He's obviously active, and, 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 and Isaac is alluded to in, a, in, a, in an offhanded way in one place here. But the person of Isaac has been edited out of the record through the whole death of his mother and all that. So he's personally edited out of the record until, personally edited out, out of the record until he's united with his bride by the well of the high road. That's two chapters later. The well, of the, Iroi, the well of the living one who sees me, is what it means. I think that's kind of fun. One does integrated design. The New Testament is in Old Testament concealed. That's what I mean by it. And the, New, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. We understand Genesis 22 because of what happened on the cross, and vice versa. And of course, there's a whole marriage model here. But all through the scripture, there are Gentile brides, by the way. Eve and Adam, of course. Uh, Rebecca and Isaac, we've just seen. We're going to get Asana. Joseph in Egypt is going to take Asana. He'll take a Gentile bride. Moses takes Zipporah up there in Midian. S Salmon took Rahab, who's, and, and Rahab's son, Roaz, take, takes, uh, Boaz takes uh, Ruth, right? This, these, there are six of these, what I'll call Gentile brides. Do you know what's interesting about these Gentile brides? None of them have their death recorded. Now, obviously, don't misunderstand. Obviously, they died. But it's interesting that from a scriptural point of view, their death is not recorded. I think that's interesting. No death recorded. And you also, if you understand the Jewish way, you really need to understand how it starts with a betrothal, with a payment of a purchase price, at which part the bride is set apart from that point on for him. They're still not married yet, but she's committed. So is he.
And there's all kinds of examples of that. I won't go through all the verses. Then the bridegroom departs after that betrothal, the ketubah. They, he departs to his father's house to add a room for her. He prepares a room addition. The bride, in the meantime, prepares for his imminent return. She doesn't know when he's coming back. It could be a month. It could be years. She doesn't know. But she's got to be ready at any moment because he's going to deliberately show up by surprise. The surprise gathering it was the next step. The hoopah, the wedding, it's the wedding proper, as we think it, and it's a seven-day marriage supper. You see parallels here? You know, people, you know, I, I remember, we, it, you'll find details of all this elaborate in our, in our little briefing pack on the rapture. And I know many people who are sort of post-trib totally abandoned their position as they understood the pattern of the ancient pattern of Isra Israeli marriage and what God is really doing here. So the marriage fulfilled. See, there was a covenant established. There was a purchase price. The bride set apart. She's reminded of the covenant. These are all New Testament verses. The bridegroom left for the father's house. There'll be an escort to accompany him upon his return to the to gather his bride. And, uh, yeah, woo, yeah, isn't that fun? Yeah. So you want to study that. But uh, we are now obviously from in session 17 finishing we, Isaac. We have one more session on Isaac forthcoming. And um, so next time we'll talk about the death of Sarah. We'll pick up the chapter we skipped. I wanted to, I didn't want to delay. I wanted you to get this material. So I uh, we'll take pick up chapter 23 next time, and we'll talk about the birth of Esau and Jacob. And the covenant, chapter 26, very important, the covenant will be confirmed to Isaac and also to Jacob in uh, chapter 26. So that will wrap up our perspective of Isaac as we move on then, from then on to Jacob. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.